gardening for me is kind of my way to clear my head as far as that goes, what goes. So when I work in the hospital and things are kind of crazy and out of hand, I always know the next morning I could get outside and do something and kind of set it all aside and clear whatever. So I really enjoy it. But basically today, you know, we're going to be talking about ferns and fiddleheads to fronds. Uh, some common misconceptions of ferns, you know, people in general, now I know this group is probably more enlightened than a lot of groups, but some things that go on, people consider them boring, you know, all you have is foliage, there's no fragrance, there's no flowers, you know, and you're looking at, you know, people think Boston ferns and they think ferns and things like that. There's a lot of people treat them as annuals or houseplants, you know, they have rabbit foot ferns, or like I said, they have uh, Boston ferns. One year, they don't try to save them, they get tossed in the garbage or the compost pile, they're gone. Uh, there's limited choices. A lot of folks feel there's limited choices. And part of that, I think, has to deal with the green industry itself. Really, ferns haven't started, you know, coming out until the last five, ten years, where, you know, nurserymen now are starting to propagate more ferns, offering more choices. Before, it was extremely limited either. To be honest, people were going out there and digging them up in the woods and whatnot and taking them back to their houses because you really couldn't find. There weren't a lot of sources, either mail order or local. And now that's starting to change where you're seeing more and more ferns uh, coming up. Also, there's an the idea that ferns are high maintenance. And granted, some ferns uh, can require you know higher maintenance than others, but usually the ones we're going to talk about today, I'm not going to discuss staghorn ferns or you know the true tropicals, but the terrestrial ferns that grow around here, really, once you get them established and if you have them in a, you know, a correct spot, you know, after that first year, after getting them, you know, watered, you know, they actually do pretty well. It doesn't require a lot of maintenance on your part, you know. And then, you know, this thing we were just discussing as far as ideal conditions to divide. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. You know, folks think you need to have the perfect amount of shade or, you know, I don't have a spot in my yard. And really, you can look around your yard and you can find some of those little microclimates or other areas that you can tuck a fern in here and there. And actually, they do quite well. So there are some things you can kind of work around as far as that goes. Now, ferns are that group of plants that folks treat. It's kind of like Rodney Dangerfield. They get no respect. <laughs> ferns just don't, people don't want to, you know, they just, when you think about a fern, it's an afterthought, you know. It's like, well, why don't you try a fern, you know. But I guarantee if you walk around, you know, a lot of yards in your neighborhood, you're not going to find, all, you know, ferns in there. I bet the vast majority of them are going to be fewer, you know, almost none. So just to give you something to kind of build up ferns, they've existed almost 360 million years. And ferns are the primary source of uh, the plant material that's in coal today. So think about how, you know, ferns dominated the landscape, you know, a long, long time ago. And they've been used in experiments now in two different shuttle flights. We've had them on Space Shuttle Discovery, the resurrection of fern actually was taken up there. And they get in Space Shuttle Columbia in 99, they actually did some research with the spores and whatnot up there, sea fern, which is an aquatic fern. So, and then they're adapted to a wide variety of environments. You know, you have ferns that are totally aquatic, like uh, Azola, which is mosquito ferns, some others. You have a lot that are terrestrial. And then you have some that will even grow in desert. Okay, so pretty much conditions all around. Give an example, the resurrection fern. Now, this was taken over in Shane Forest. And I don't know if folks see them. Everyone looks down the ground for ferns. This one was in the fall, and you can see it's growing 20 feet up in a tree. Now, the resurrection ferns are actually an epiphyte that'll grow up there, it's estimated they could lose up to 97% of their water and still remain viable. Now most plants, if they lose about 10% of the water or are on their way out the door, and that's gonna be it. But they can go up to 97%. And it's also been estimated they could actually survive almost 100 years in a desiccated state. I don't know who did that or how they did it, but I've seen it. Looked at three different articles that have found the same thing, that they feel they could survive like that. Unfortunately, what took this one down, I went back there to, to check on it, because I hike a lot of times over in Shank Forest, and the tree has come down on its own. Mm. It was not the bird's problem. Now, a lot of folks know that some ferns are edible. Your ostrich fern, the croziers and the fiddleheads in the spring, you know, are edible. A lot of people also eat bracken fern. That's the one that's down there on the left. 
Now, Brackenford is also considered poisonous. Just to let folks know, it can actually has been known to kill cattle and horses that eat a lot of it. So, in moderation, there's some considerations there. And then they also say that ferns have a potential role in bioremediation. Uh, the bracken fern we just mentioned actually likes to take up heavy metals like arsenic and lead in the soil, which is great. So you have them in the fern, but then what are you going to do with the fern after it absorbs all that? It has to be deposited somewhere. And also for cleaning indoor air, the Boston fern, which I mentioned before, that actually they found is an excellent kind of air purifier. It takes out xylene, toluene, and formaldehyde. So a lot of the solvents that are in carpeting, things like that, can actually you know improve that. So people give them a little more credit than what they currently get. They can also be used as biofertilizer or livestock feed. The uh, azola, which is a mosquito fur, actually grows in water and it's capable of doubling its biomass every two days. So in Southeast Asia, they actually use it. They'll irrigate their fields or flood their fields, grow it, it you know, produces like mad, and then they'll drain their fields and then you've got this biofertilizer. It's fixed nitrogen and whatnot, and they have it there. Mm -hmm. So, but around here, it'll cover an entire pond, and it'll choke things out, so it depends on location. They can be found on all continents, except Antarctica, and there's over 12,000 species, with East Asia having the largest number of identified species. In North America, I think there's around 440 species that are identified here, but usually Asian, that's why you're seeing if you walk in the gardens here at um, J.C. Ralston or over at Tony Havens, they're introducing a lot of plants now coming from China, Japan, Korea, areas like that. Now, fern anatomy is just a little different than your average plant, so just some terminology. You have the rhizome, everyone understands that, the roots. You have the stipe, so rather than a pedial, it's called a stipe, which is that part below the blade on the fern. And the stipe and the blade both are considered the frond of the plant. Then you have the rachis, which is actually that center part of the blade that runs up, so from the top of the stipe to the tip. And then the pinna is the individual oops, part right here of the blades. And usually for identification purposes, it depends on how finely that's divided. Sometimes you'll have a solid blade, like some of the hard tongues ferns that aren't divided at all. The other ones that are singly divided to double to triply divided. And that's usually a key characteristic as far as identifying the type of fern that you have. Now ferns in the garden, one, we mentioned before, they're deer resistant. Now there's no such thing as a plant that's deer proof, but deer resistant, you know, is out there. And usually they're probably one of the last things that, that deer will go ahead and mess with. They have few diseases and pest issues. You know, occasionally you may get a slug or something like that, but really there's very few insect problems and very few disease problems you have, okay? They require minimal maintenance, I mentioned before. Once you get them established, if you take that time when you're first putting them in to, you know, work up the soil, get it well, and keep them watered for that first year, usually they can kind of do it on their own. They play nice with others. Now, ferns are not the type of plant that you're going to have to put in the ground and worry about that you're going to, every spring you're out there digging them up or taking it out because it's spread into this bed, that bed, whatever. There are a few ferns that can be a problem. One is the bracken fern. It will spread. You know, it has pretty strong rhizomes. The sensitive fern down here in the bottom on the left, that also has pretty uh, decent rhizomes. I have it in my garden, though. It's really easy to trim back. I just go out there in the fall. If it's in somewhere I don't like it, cut off the rhizome. It pulls up very easily. It's not a, an issue at all to kind of keep it contained. But in general, most ferns are, you have usually clumping types, you know, kind of like the tassel fern that's over here on the right hand side. And, you know, so don't have to worry about the spread. Now, as far as choices go, I mean, there's a lot of considerations. You mentioned um, you have both native and non-native, and there's a lot of native ferns that actually do quite well. Unfortunately, it's trying to find them is more of the problem, but that's, like I said, on the left, you have the sensitive fern. Over here, you have the tassel fern that grows. That's a non-native. You have evergreen deciduous ferns. A lot of folks 
you know, don't think about that. They think of ferns dying down every year and not coming back, and you have a bare spot in your garden, but you have the Christmas fern, which is probably the most indigenous or the easily found fern around here. If you hike anywhere over at Umstead or Eno or Shank, it's always out there in the woods, always green year round until the new fronds come out, so it's easily found. The Japanese holly fern is another one that stays evergreen around here. Looks good, shiny green leaves out there. And then one a lot of folks are familiar with, the painted fern, okay, Ethereum. It'll grow and then it's going to die down and disappear on you in the fall. So you're going to have a bare spot there or just nothing. And then another one I like that's kind of coming along, I started propagating recently, is the green cliff break fern down here on the bottom right. And that's a fern that actually has a black stipe, black rachis, uh, kind of a coarsely divided leaf. Looks good, you know, but the same thing. When we have that first frost, they're gone. They'll die down and disappear. <clears throat> now, the other choices are size when you're looking at ferns. And I'm just talking about terrestrial ferns here for this area. The one on the left is a Scott spleenwort. That's actually a cross between an ebony spleenwort which most people have probably have in their yard, small plant, probably about six or eight inches, and a walking fern. And that's a naturally occurring hybrid. And that only gets about four, six inches tall. Then you have Rewardio orientalis. Now that's growing right out here in front of this building. And this is a oriental chain fern. Now those fronds will get probably four, four and a half feet if they have ideal conditions. As far as that grows, kind of hang over. And this is just a sampling of some of the things I just ran around in the yard, picking a few things with the yard stick in the middle, just as far as sizes go. So you have the ebony spleenwort, you have, this is actually an Indian holly fern, Japanese holly fern, that's for the green, green cliff break, that's a lady fern called lady in red, you have your painted fern, and that is actually a autumn fern there, and that is a sensitive fern. So it kind of gives you an idea as far as sizes go what you can do and what you can, you know, for your different areas. So you don't have to settle for something. You can either combine them or, you know, look at different things depending on what kind of look you want. Like I said, some ferns, or most ferns are probably clumpers, but if you look at things like the Woodwardia orientalis, it doesn't produce a lot of fronds. You probably get three, four, five fronds on the plant. And that's kind of it. It doesn't have a nice, compact, neat look, so you want it to kind of spill over somewhere. And then as far as the other thing is frond styles, you know, something to consider. So this is the Indian holly fern. You can see down the middle of each of those thin on them, you have kind of a yellow gold color that stands out. They're an evergreen fern. You have the heart's tongue fern that grows there. That's a solid leaf that comes up. And then this is the green cliff break I was telling you about. So it's more of an open look. So like I said, those are all things to consider when you're choosing ferns. Now, when you're growing them, location, location, location. Because like I said, your little realtor block, your realtor got it right. Think microclimate. So like I said, you don't have to have the perfect amount of shade, but if you have walls, rocks, taller shrubs, you can plant underneath or nearby, maybe just to give them that afternoon shade. And a lot of ferns will actually do quite well. Okay, so think about that. Plus, I think when you have those microclimates like near rocks or walls, it tends to kind of mitigate some of the stress on them. So water maybe collects there a little more, whatnot. So those are ideal spots to consider. You want to amend the soil, okay? So I always use compost and fine pine bark when I'm initially planting them. And uh, you know, usually you want to take time doing that. That's well worth the effort. You want to water on a regular basis for that first year, so you don't want to stress them. You know, there's an idea that some folks think that plants that are, you know, low maintenance, you shouldn't have to do anything. But even with uh, master gardeners, we have a water-wise gardener over the state fair, and really, it got watered the first year to get everything established. After that, it's kind of left on its own. But you can't just, you know, put something out there, water it twice, and expect it to make it through our summers. So that first year, and then mulch. Mulch is the best thing for ferns. It's probably that's the biggest thing as far as maintenance goes with ferns. Leaves collected in the fall are great. 
neighbors think I'm crazy because I go up and down the street when they're raking their knees out there with my lawnmower. I run over them once with the lawnmower, gather them up, and then I drag them with the tarp into my backyard. And I think they don't know what I'm doing back there, but they just see me out there collecting. But they really are, and it's the perfect material. I would stay away from things like pine bark. It's heavy. You know, sometimes the ferns have trouble getting up through it, but pine needles or pine straw are fine, and like I said, leaves are great too. So. Fertilizer. To be honest, I do not fertilize my ferns. Now, some folks recommend using a slow-release fertilizer when you're growing, but to be honest, you know, if you amend the soil, I think with compost and the pine bark, and then you're good about mulching and letting that break down during the year. I've had, you know, good success with that. I don't go back through. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, do you, when you mulch with leaves, do you chop up the leaves or? I go over them once with a lawnmower. So I don't, you know, I don't make them fine or anything, but we have a lot of oak trees in our neighborhood and those things, if you put them out there, they just, if they get wet and heavy, they're just, you've got a mass of wet heavy leaves, <laughs> you know, so I just hit them once with the lawnmower, they tend to break down a little quicker and also it kind of makes them a little uh, easier for the plants to come up through and push through. <coughs> Then trimming really is not necessary for ferns. Ferns don't require, like I mentioned before, a lot of maintenance. So, you know, trimming is more for what makes you happy. You know, if you're one of those people that has to have the perfect looking bed, you don't want to have a, a mass of dead fronds down at the base of the ferns with new ones coming up, you know, by all means, go ahead and do it. But other than if, you know, I have a fern that maybe has a frond that's, you know, been broken for whatever reason, I don't trim at all. I let them just what you'll find with the Christmas ferns and like the uh, Indian holly fern or the Japanese holly fern, the evergreen ones, those fronds will gradually lay down come spring and then you'll have the new crosiers and fiddleheads coming up the middle. And I think it looks fine, but some people don't like that. Okay, so things to consider. And then containers. You know, containers, a lot of folks think of just Boston ferns or some kind of hanging plant. Uh, but actually, you can put a lot of different ferns in containers. The, in, or the uh, Japanese holly fern does great in containers. If you have, it has those sharp, glossy green leaves, this is my one design tip. So beyond that, don't ask me anything as far as that. But you know, if you have a you know a squared off container or sharp, and you get that in there, it actually will tolerate a fair amount of sun. It'll look good, you know, occasional watering, and do great. The other thing up in my deck, I have a container that has painted fern in it. Now painted fern, you know, can be rather delicate. Now when we go on vacation, if we're gone for, you know, a week and a half, two weeks, and my son, you know, doesn't water, which happens on a regular basis, you know, I'll come home to a bunch of brown fronds. But to be honest, the painted ferns will come back. You know, you start watering again, you trim them up, and I'll get a second flush of growth out of them in this, you know, late summer. So something to consider. So I would consider using ferns more in containers. You know, you can use them with other plants too. Let me go back here. Now, a couple of things to mention about ferns I didn't put out there as far as success goes. One, you know, you don't want to plant them in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle, okay? So if you stick them out in the middle of your front yard, full sun, they're not going to do well. Unless you're out there watering all the time, you might as well say goodbye to them. The other thing is they don't tolerate traffic. So if you have them near pass and stuff where people tend to step over or step out, you know, they will break the fronds, that sort of thing. My wife got revenge on me. She retired and she started uh, doing puppy rescue for one of the local lab rescues. <laughs> and we've had 16 puppies this year. It's like bringing home a newborn every couple of weeks. And it sounds great, but when you take them outside, they don't care what's going on. If I raise the fern, it's taken me 10 months to get it to the stage where I'm transplanting it out. All of a sudden they find it and they're ripping them up like there's no problem, or they're trampling them down. So they don't take a lot of traffic, so just be aware of that. Like I said, that's my payback for bringing home seeds and leaving things around and putting little baggies in the refrigerator to stratify things that have, you know, damp paper towels in it and stuff. And she's going like, what is that? <laughs> so, like I said, I have to just put up with it. <laughs> now, fern propagation. A lot of people think, you know, ferns are difficult or, you know, there's only one way of doing it. And then, you know, most people think of dividing the rhizomes. You can see that's a painting example of a uh, sensitive fern over here on the right. You can see they have pretty good sized rhizomes there. And they're easy enough to divide. You can just cut them off with some roots on it, you know, a bud, and you know, easy to propagate, easy to have them spread. 
other uh, firms will actually produce, you know, vegetative structures. They call them bubbles or you can develop plantlets. And I have an example up here, and actually there's one growing outside. That's the oriental chain fir. And you can see what it does in late summer. It actually, each of those little leaves you see on each of the pinna there, that's actually a separate fern that's growing. And they're very easy. The leaves will lay down, they'll root on their own, or you can just brush them off, take them. You can put them in a pot with some moist potting soil, cover them with some saran wrap, keep them moist for about three weeks, they'll root on their own. Extremely easy to do. Walking ferns, kind of the same way. I mentioned about the Scott's Fleenwort fern, which is a combination uh, walking fern, the tips will touch the ground and they'll root there. So there are some other alternative ways of propagating ferns. Now, a lot of folks stay away when they think of spores and ferns. They just, it seems like it's going to be too much effort. And I really want to encourage folks to try to, you know, the technique is not all that difficult and really it gives you an opportunity to produce a large number of ferns. I won't say quickly, it's not a quick process by any means, but it produces a large number of ferns and also gives you a chance to try ferns that you can't find available in the stores. Like I said, your selections are kind of limited. So, but from a single frond, you can produce sometimes millions of spores. They, they estimate, like some of the glade ferns, they can produce five million spores on one frond. They don't just drop. Now you think with that kind of numbers that they're producing, we should be knee deep in ferns. I mean, we should be <laughs> out here mowing ferns, you know, because we can't get rid of things. But their whole life cycle makes it kind of difficult for them to kind of get established, and we'll talk about that. In ancient times, folks actually didn't understand how ferns reproduced, you know. And it got to the point because they didn't see flowers, didn't see seeds. I was believed that the sea could bestow invisibility on the bearer. <laughs> and this was actually people would sell this magic seed. Mm -hmm. But the requirements for success as far as spores go, one, you need to have viable spores. Now spores, you'll go out there to ferns and folks, most people are familiar with how the, the spore structures are in ferns, usually on the underside of the leaf, sometimes along the edge, sometimes you'll see dots running down the middle or the edges of the pinna. And what you need, you know, you'll see those structures there, but a lot of times if you don't catch them at the right time, either the spores have already dispersed or you get them too soon and the spores aren't right. So usually when those structures are around kind of a yellow or light tan color, they're usually getting just about right. And then cleanliness is important because it takes a long time for this process to produce a mature fern from a spore. So if you contaminate the soil or you know, things like algae, Fungi will get in there. I've had slime molds appear, you know, you know, in cultures and things like that. That can make it difficult, you know, for so you have to really give them a chance. Another key ingredient is moisture, humidity. They need a lot of humidity. They're starting out. You're talking about, you know, a structure that you know is microscopic that you're sprinkling on top of the soil. You want to have it going, so you need to provide those conditions. And then patience. There's several, uh, what do you say, phases that the fern goes through when it's uh, sprouting from a spore. And each of those phases can take anywhere from six weeks to three months, okay? Just to produce that first tiny, tiny true fern. And then after that, you still have to grow it out from there. So, just to make you aware of. So why aren't ferns more common? Well, they need those, you know, ideal conditions. Has anybody been to Ireland? <coughs> I love Ireland. It's like fur growing territory. It's the Northwest. You can't go wrong. This was actually uh, on the right hand side. This was a uh, water trough for a mill that was growing out. You can see the heart tongue fern. Just loved it. They had the moisture. They got some shade from the wall. It was fairly cool. They were spreading like mad. Over in my yard, I have an old, old shed. And really, there's very few spots that I've had them pop up on the road from spores. This is actually the drip line. You can see it running down here from the shed. These are Christmas ferns that have decided to take up residence there because it gets just a little bit more moisture than the usual spot and still shaded. So it gets some shade from the shed, gets some shade from the magnolia tree that's on the other side, and just propped up there. But usually in your yard, you're not going to find, at least a lot of people don't find, them sprouting up and coming on the road. And I'll give you some more information about why. Now the life cycle, you can see the back of the leaf here, 
And those are the score cases coming on. And this is actually, I believe it's a Japanese holly firm that's on the back. So you have the scores, they ripen up, and they'll deposit the scores. You know, once the case opens up, spills the scores out. And then the first part is called the gametophyte stage. What happens is that spore produces what they say is prothallus. Now, prothallus is a small, green, heart-shaped organ. And I've got some examples up there. You can look at those cups when we're done here to see what they look like. But it's not very thick. And actually on the prothallus, there are female and male organs. And like I said, it takes probably six to eight weeks or six weeks to three months to get just the prothallus to grow out. And then from there, and those female and male organs are actually on the bottom of that. Then on top of that, you still need moisture because the sperm has to swim over to the egg, you get a zygote. And then finally, another three to six months, hopefully you're gonna have a young sporophyte. And that's actually the true fern that'll come up. So this process is not at all easy in what you see. Now, spore collection, like I mentioned, uh, that's actually something fun to do. If people haven't tried it, you can go out and find you know, your fronds. I mean, the worst that's going to happen, you cut a frond, you're going to put it down, and nothing shows. Either the spores aren't there, or you know, they've already gone. But you know, I would encourage folks to try it a couple times just to see a piece of paper. I've gotten to the point, I used to always do this with just plain white paper. I now take them, and I cut them, and they're going into envelopes, because I don't want to have same thing with my wife. You know, she's tired of seeing pieces of paper laying around with things on them that she doesn't know if she can throw out or not. So we've got rid of that. So, and you can actually see what happened here. The spores have dispersed. And a lot of times with those spores, you're also getting part of the spore cases too. So people think there's a lot of spores there. Actually, if you took that paper and kind of blew that off, a lot of that would be this chafer that you don't need. And you'll find these just tiny, tiny black powder on there, which is actually the, the fern spores themselves. Now we've mentioned the gametophyte stage, and that's the first stage. That's when the spore start, just starts to grow. And what happens, it's producing that prothallus, okay? And those are the archegonium are the female structures, the anthridium are the male structures, and it produces rhizoids. There actually aren't roots. And this is actually upside down. This is the underside of that structure. And this is what they look like growing in culture. So you can actually see a little bit of rhizoids coming out there on the side. So it's really kind of, you know, it takes a long time for that just to show up. When you first are growing spores, you will see kind of a covering over the medium that almost looks like moss, to be honest. It's fine, it's kind of a dark green, and looks in there, and it depends on how thickly you, you sow the spores, and that's another thing. It's difficult to really control how many spores you're gonna spray, you know, spread on a culture. You can sometimes dump them and the whole thing will be covered. Other times you'll have, you know, a few scattered here and there, what goes. And then finally you get to the sporophyte stage, and that's where you actually start producing the true ferns. And you can see here on this culture, these prothallia are growing, and here's the true ferns just starting to come up. And this is a culture where actually they've been a number of months, and you can see how you just get covered with ferns there, finally. Now these things are tiny. You're talking probably about half an inch, if that, maybe a quarter of an inch. And then the next step is going to be having to transplant those out, prick them out, and then put them into pots. And humidity is still very, very important through all these stages. Okay, so they're essentially 100% humidity. They're in a container that's sealed, you know, and you're keeping them in there other than check the water and that sort of thing. They're covered. And then once you prick them out, and then, like I said, start putting them in cell packs to try to grow them out. Yes, ma'am. What are they growing on? Those are actually Jiffy 7 pellets. <laughs> that I've cut back the netting on. So, but you can do, there's a variety of ways. And we'll go through that. If you come to the you know, workshop, we've got a lot of things there, but that's kind of a quick down and dirty. And then as far as resources for folks, you know, you've got the American Fern Society, you know, which I recommend. Both the American Fern Society and the Hardy Fern Foundation both have what they have, uh, spore collections, and they're willing to trade and also to sell spores to members and with your membership you're allowed so many packets of spores. So if you really want to try different varieties of you know ferns and they're not available, I would encourage you to do that. Also another good resource is native plants. But for Georgia, 
which is Ferns, and that's an online publication from the University of Georgia that you can download. That actually does a good job as far as identifying natives, and it's fairly concise, uh, but has good pictures in it, some you know good short details. And then if you want to try as far as growing ferns from spores and some of the things that are involved in the process, uh, the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens has a good article that's available online also. That's probably one of the better ones I've seen. Now, does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, we live up against the Jordan Lake game lands, uh -huh. and there are resurrection ferns uh -huh. growing there. Mm -hmm. Does the, and one of the, like you said, the tree fell down. Does the tree have to be alive for the fern? No, because they'll grow on rocks even, survive. things okay. like that. And actually, they're probably one, I've never been able to get them established in my yard. I've seen some people actually use glue and will take them and glue <laughs> some of the stem along the side and the bark creases and like an oak tree or something like that to try to get them established because they just don't want you can't plant them in soil they don't want to be in soil you know yes ma'am um okay so if the male and the female things are on the bottom of that tiny little mm -hmm. prothallus uh, prothallus okay uh -huh. um so how does you know tony Evans talks about the ferns having unprotected sex with each other and coming up with different fern varieties mm -hmm. and um i had i planted a japanese fern mm -hmm. japanese painted fern uh -huh. and um now i have a gazillion different kinds of ferns they're one of the of few... all different colors yeah. and so on and i've done the same thing with japanese painted fern. it's probably more promiscuous than others you know, like, <laughs> as far as uh, like uh Indian holly fern, you know, usually when you plant those spores or you're growing them out, you'll have a plant that looks identical to the parent. The painted fern and whatnot, you will grow them out and I could get 60 different varieties. You'll have some that'll have red stems with green leaves, you know, it's just, if you really want to take a shot at it and see what goes. It's the same thing with some of the crested ferns, the crested lady ferns that have the little gross at the end and things, like, uh, what's it, Felix Femina, one they have that's kind of a an odd shape pinna on it. And you can grow that and you'll end up with a hundred different varieties of pinna. They won't look the same as the parent. You know, you have to divide it if you want to get that same look as the parent. But how are they doing it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, so you've got that little thing there, so how is it coming up with different colorations and so on? I mean, All I can think is, you know, as far as, because you've got half the, what's happening, and you've got, Half your genes, in, you know, from sperm, half in the egg, and there must be just enough variation either when they produce those things that when they come up and they finally match together, it's giving that little slight difference, you know. Even though you can match certain people in a family and you look at six kids and you can pick out all six kids and set them there, there's always, there may be one or two that just not sure they really belong, you know, <laughs> for whatever reason, you know, so. But that's what I say, in this stage, this is actually called the haploid stage, and so you've only got half the, the genes in one, half in the other. And I think there's just enough variation in, you know, they've done a lot of breeding with uh, lady ferns as far as picking out varieties, so I think some of that is in there and just, it's depending on who mates with who, what goes on underneath, you know. Whereas, like I said, a lot of these others, you know, are pretty well set, you know, as far as plants go. So like your Christmas fern, you know, you'll find Christmas ferns out there. But when I was collecting spores actually for this workshop and looking out there, you can, there's actually a fair variety of Christmas ferns. Where you'll get different, you know, on their pinna. Some are more serrated than others, you know, on the, along the edges and stuff, which, you know, probably if you really wanted to start breeding it, you could start looking at that. I don't know if it'd be worth it, but you know, there are some things out there. Victorian age, when they had the, the age of ferns, People, you know, would always be looking for something different, you know, in their garden. So they had crested ferns, which have, you know, those odd growths at the tips, or colors and that sort of thing. I mean, they would just went crazy looking for anything, and they would isolate it and grow it out. So, yes, ma'am. Um, the fiddleheads, you know, you hear about eating those. Mm -hmm. Are there particular types of ferns that you would grow for fiddleheads to eat? Ostrich ferns, sometimes they'll say cinnamon fern, kind of the same family. The big thing about those, they're recommending you steam them or boil them for at least 10 to 15 minutes prior to eating. They have had, you know, incidents where folks have gotten sick with it. And there's also been some concern, there are some, apparently some carcinogens. Now, I think if you have one or two meals of 
fiddleheads, you know, it's just like anything. You're not going to do you in. But just to be aware of it, if you're reading a lot of them, that sort of thing. So, yes. What are the best ferns for the conditions that uh, Chris was talking about, dry shade underneath oak trees, for example? Well, you know, as far as I go, Christmas ferns, once they're established, they're tough as nails. I mean, you got to really work at them to try to kill them. Uh, the Indian holly fern, you know, will actually do well. The Japanese holly fern has a thicker leaf and whatnot. That'll do well. You know, so that will take some dry shade. You have some of the desert ferns now. Some of those desert ferns, people think, you know, they grow in the middle of everything. But actually, you'll find them either in arroyos, you know, kind of semi-shaded for part of the day or next to rocks or larger plants, like the chilianthus, linosa, you know, that grows out there. That will take more full sun. It's not a very big fern, though. It's like six inches tall and, you know, it doesn't look like much. But, you know, they'll take, usually if you can get afternoon shade is what you're looking for. Or, like I said, you know, if it grows near a wall or something where you kind of benefit from some of that thing and how the sun moves, you know, will do well. But those are probably some of the easiest ones to grow through. The painted ferns, unless you're going to keep them watered or that sort of thing. Chilianthus, actually, that I mentioned up there, the green cliff break. I've had pretty good luck with that in, you know, fairly bright conditions. It seems to tolerate it well once it's established. The other thing to know about ferns, too, is that a lot of your ferns, they don't emerge at the same time. People think everything's going to come up, you know, at one time. And so you need to be, you know, aware of that, like my Christmas ferns are usually one of the first ones to start coming up. Things like the chilianthus, the green cliff break, I don't see it till the end of May, you know, just starting to emerge. And you have to be careful if you're cleaning out your beds, if you're one of those people that's a real neat person and you want everything looking good and you're out there raking like crazy and you tear out those fiddleheads or crozes, you know, you're damaging the first leaves that are coming up. Now, you probably won't kill the plant, but you're going to have to wait a little longer to get something that looks, you know, fairly good. So just be careful with that. Yes, ma'am. I thought that the Christmas ferns were evergreen, so why do we have to wait for them to come up to know where they were? Oh, well, those you don't have to. I'm sorry. I'm talking about oh, other things that grow down, like the painted ferns. And oh, whatnot. okay. I thought you said the Christmas ferns. No, okay. if I did, I apologize. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a wooded lot, and so I have a very good, you know, environment mm -hmm. to just put ferns in the ground, but I'd like to start using them in containers more. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what kind of soil to use in containers. Just the good potting mix. You know, the regular potting mix. You don't need anything special, special as far as that goes. So you don't have to mend it with compost? I don't, you know, no. If you, a lot of the potting mixes now usually have some kind of slow release fertilizer in there for three or four months, you know, you can start with. And that probably gets you going. Yeah, so I don't think you know. I, for planting them out in the garden, if you have clay soils and that sort of thing, that's more for the compost and the mending of the vine bark. Yes, um, one into a garden in a wooded area, mm -hmm. so there's lots of roots. If I'm going to amend the soil and maybe build, not a berm, but just raise that area, how much, how deep does it need to be? I would say, you know, it depends on what happens. If you raise it up too high, then it gets dry, you know what I'm saying? So, and plus you don't want to smother your roots or whatnot, <laughs> so I would probably do more than three or four inches if I was doing that, you know, okay. in between times. And then mulching with the leaves, mm -hmm. like if my husband's going to cut the grass and there's some leaves, mm -hmm. can you use that with the grass and the leaves? I would, I stay away from grass, just the grass gets kind of, it, it mats down, it gets heavy and things like that, unless you have a lot of leaves in it. If you're like talking about mowing your, your grass in the fall and you have a lot of leaves right. in the lawn, yeah. where you get a decent kind of mixture of it then I would consider doing it. But if it, you know, if there's more grass and there are leaves, I would stay away from that just because you know how grass gets. It gets that heavy mat thing. And I don't think the appearance is all that good when it turns yellow green. Yes, ma'am. Are the um, deciduous ferns with the black native? No, they're actually, I think, from Argentina. Oh, really? Yeah. OK. So. But they, I mean, I've got them all over here. And they just continue to spread, which I mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. but I wish are they the ones that are on here that I was I, showing, or something different? I honestly don't know. Oh, okay. I have to go home and look. Yeah. And also, is there anything you can do with the Boston farm? <laughs> <laughs> we said, as far as outside. In the, outside, well, they're not. You know, unfortunately, they're they're fairly tropical. You know, so they're not going to survive with frost or anything like that. So if you want to bring them inside, or you can, you know reproduce, you know, new ones, you can take some of those shoots that are coming off and replant those and 
start another plant, you know, and get it going. But as far as, you know, other than, you know, you can put them in pots or hanging baskets and they, you know, they look good. But as far as otherwise, they're not going to, you know, stay out there forever. Get them for Christmas. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. There is a native fern that's got a black pennant called the Broad Beach Fern. Mm -hmm. So that might be what she has in her uh, yard. Growing up there. And maybe broad beach fern. Maiden hair does too. Yeah. Beach. Has a, have a black brown. Okay. Mm -hmm. And my second question was, I have a pass along fern that came from my grandmother to my mother, and it basically looks like a frilly Boston fern. And it's now mine is starting to revert back to regular Boston fern mm -hmm. leaf. I mean, whatever. So can you cut those out like you do on shrubs and trees to keep it from the rest of it reverting? Oh, you mean talking about those sections that yeah. are coming off? Yeah. Okay. Give it a whirl and do that. Or take some of those sections with the leaves, that, the style that you like, and then repotting just those. Yeah, they're really the easy on to it. separate out and mm -hmm. pass along to mm -hmm. other master partners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> PH? PH, you know, usually they'll, it depends on the fur. Now, some of them like the heart's tongue and things like that. Some ferns like more alkaline soil, so that's why you find them kind of growing near rocks and crevices like that, you know, will do well. Most ferns, though, you know, you're looking at a fairly neutral or just slightly acidic, you know, pH, and they do fine with that. So if my soil is 4.5 to 5 max, is that too acidic for most ferns? Well, they probably grow, but maybe not well, I would consider. That's awful acidic there. It is. It's pretty heavy compared to most, so it's hard to say. I will give it a try, and I'll probably try some of the hardier ferns first, like Christmas fern, and see what happens with it. It may not tolerate it. You know, it's hard to say. Yes, Would you please discuss some of the legality of collecting ferns? <laughs> well, yes. it depends on what you want to do or where you're collecting. That's big. Yeah, well, that's so. You know, as far as things go, you know, I've got my ferns some. You know, the nice thing about ferns, if you're collecting with spores, you're talking about it, a few pinna off a leaf, so you're not doing major damage, you know, I hate to say that, but, you know, that in an envelope and you can get yourself started with it. You know, anything, you know, in the state parks, they're going to tell you they don't want you collecting ferns up there, they don't want to see you out there digging up ferns, you know, that sort of thing. A lot of people, a few that have them in New York, actually are pretty amenable for you taking folks. I've talked to folks and they don't mind doing that, they're kind of surprised, you know, if you want to try it, go ahead you know, take a frond. That's why I recommend, too, as far as the, the societies, both the American Fern Society and the Hardy Fern Foundation, you know, both those groups, you know, have a big spore bank, and you can easily order packets. I think they're 50 cents or a dollar a piece, and, you know, get spores that members have grown that you can try and propagate yourself, so. And then, you know, the thing is, if you have friends that have farms or woods, you know, that's where I've gotten my first Christmas ferns and things like that. You know, I went out there and they invited if you want to dig them up, go for it. The other thing is the Native Plant Society for North Carolina. Occasionally they'll do rescue, so when they're putting in new roads, if you get with them and get on their list, they'll say, we're going out, you know, Johnston County here, because they're putting in an extension to whatever highway. And pretty much, you know, they'll let you, whatever you can dig up and take with you, it's fair game, you know, as far as that goes. What they'll have you, the name of North Carolina Native okay. Plant Society. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's, if you do a Google that's search, right. it'll come up. And like I said, they actually do plant rescues. And that's another thing, you know, you go out with them. And it depends on what area you're going to and what's available. But, you know, the way they're looking at it, they got permission because they're just gonna come through bulldozers and rip everything out there. So if you want to take some things, have at it. Yes, Is there a good time of year to uh, divide ferns? I usually do that actually in the spring. You know, some people like to know a lot of plants they say do it in the fall, but I actually prefer to do it in the spring coming up. So right when the rosiers are coming up, you know, and try to cut them in half or do whatnot, divide them that. Just so I can kind of keep an eye on them. Plus I want to water them to make sure they're getting established well. And that's just my preference. Are there any ferns that would do well in the equivalent of a shady rain garden where an area that um, occasionally is going to have water, a thin sheet of water sheeting across it? And Actually, there are, yeah. You can do some of that. Uh, Ostrich fern, some of the others, you know, actually do well as far as, you know, some of the wet, moist soils. Anybody drive down 40 towards Wilmington, and you know, right before you get into Wilmington, there's a lot of ditches on the side of the road that hold water a lot of times. You will see ferns out there 
four feet tall that are just happy as could be sitting in, you know, standing water on occasion, you know, in some shade. And they've been out there for years, you know, just coming along. So there are some choices you can use as far as, you know, those areas that are kind of saturated. But not always saturated is what I mean, like a rain garden, which is saturated right. sometimes and then other times it's going to get dry. No, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with one that's going to tolerate sitting under water, you know, like kind of a, like a bog plant or something. No, not a bog plant. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an area, um, you know, the drainage ditch out by the street, mm -hmm. okay? I got a, um, a, a real steep bank and a maple tree that's hanging over, and it's mm -hmm. total shade down there, and uh, it's too shady for grass to grow right along the street there. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's flat, so the water spreads out in sheets. It's a, like a real thin sheet of water, mm -hmm. but it's there for a day. Mm -hmm. And then it's and then it's gone. It would probably tell you know like but the ostrich birds and things like that could tolerate that you know if it's mm -hmm. if it's only temporary it's not a permanent thing they yeah. would dry that royal fern is another one to consider okay. growing that actually does well you know both of those are fairly tall ferns okay. you know so I would you know consider using something along those lines okay. we're talking about three and a half four feet you know, they really like the conditions okay. they don't mind their feet being wet. Okay. And, but they can handle it a little bit dry then at other times? Yeah, as long as, it, you know, you just have to wait and see, you know, what goes with the, the rain. If it's by a ditch or something like that, it may just be enough to kind of keep it going. Okay. Can you transplant ferns anytime? You can. I usually, like I said, I don't do it in the winter, but, you know, uh, otherwise I think pretty much any other time is fair game as far as that goes. And like I said, if I was doing that, I would make sure I'd water well, mulch well with them, things like that. That's why I kind of like, like I said, doing it in the spring and kind of like keep an eye on what's happening. Yes. Can you mulch just around it and keep the center part um, open? Brown. Or do you actually mulch over the whole thing in the winter? Actually, I just over the whole bed, just cover it over, let it go. I haven't had too much problem, you know, as far as the crozers being damaged. If you go out in the woods, you're seeing them, they're just, you know, leaves will drop on them and they're totally covered, you know, as far as that goes, and then we'll come back, so. But I just go out there, I don't worry about that, I'm trying to be neat around them or anything. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question about buying ferns. Mm -hmm. um, one nursery I found with garden supplies and carriers mm -hmm. and Do you know of any others? Or any oh, there's lots of them right here. Uh, Tony Aitman's place, you know, now Brenda, he only has four open houses a year, but. You know, he probably has one of the biggest collections. Niche Gardens, you know, over near Chapel Hill, that's another one. They do more natives, things like that. Tony has, you know, a combination of natives. Plus, he brings in a lot of ferns to trial. And actually, the Arboretum here trials quite a few of them. You know, he'll donate them, see how folks do with them. So there's a number of, you know, the nurseries that have them. Just questions. A neighbor has a climbing fern. And when I looked it up, uh, it is an invasive species and mm -hmm. not recommended. Are there right. others? As far as invasive, that's probably one of the uh, worst ones. They, they worry about it. We're kind of in an area that's not quite ideal for it. You know, it can spread. You know, it's the Japanese climbing fern. Because there is a native climbing fern. So it's actually very hard to propagate. And I, uh, over at Lena River next to the Actually, right next to the river, there's a boulder that has a, a beautiful collection of them. It's growing up these boulders, probably about 10, 20 feet, and just covers them on there. But the one you're talking about, the yeah. Japanese, yeah, it can spread. Like I said, our climate's just a little, it dies down every year, so there's potential there to do that. But I think maybe if you get more towards Johnson County, either further east or down south, you know, it's more chance for that. But I, would, I wouldn't recommend using it. Uh, what about propagating asparagus fern? Now, asparagus fern is actually not a fern. Okay. It's more related to asparagus. So they produce that kind of, you get that seed on there and things okay. like that, and you can use that, you know, as far as that goes. There are a lot of things that look similar to ferns, like your slaginella, mm -hmm. you see out there that have kind of a fern leaf, yes. you know, and whatnot. And even though it looks like that and they produce by spores, it's, you know, it's not the same thing. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do they do tissue culture? They actually do do tissue culture with fur, you know. So that's another one. 
And as far as some of those, you know, unique varieties, we were talking about the painted ferns with kind of the promiscuous behavior, you're not sure what you're going to get. You know, you do that and then you're going to be able to produce hundreds of thousands of, you know, identical copies of the same thing once you get that variety you like. But I still think, you know, it's one of those things that if you're producing, using spores, you can produce hundreds of thousands. You know, it takes time, but it's potential to do that, you know, so is it really worth it for some of the others? Do you know about rabbits? I've never had rabbits. Occasionally, if I had moles go through the garden, push up things, you know. Moles. Moles. I haven't had a problem with moles eating them either. Not to say they wouldn't, you know, if push came to shove, you know, so I can't say 100%. So you don't have rabbits? Oh, I have rabbits, but they haven't eaten my ferns. They'll eat everything else. They'll yeah. go out there and enjoy my lettuce and, you know, <laughs> whatnot, you know, what's coming up. And, Patience, yeah, so they help themselves depending on what goes on. But no, I've never had a problem with ferns. Yes? Do squirrels eat flowers and plants too, or just rabbits? The squirrels eat flowers. I've had squirrels, I haven't seen them eating flowers. I've seen them, you know, they'll take like mature fruit. I can't grow a tomato in my yard because a squirrel, invariably, as soon as they start turning a little shade of pink, they're out there gnawing on them. And I find them out there in the yard with two bites out of them rotting in my lawn, you know, and things like that, which is frustrating beyond belief. The reason I ask, we see squirrels. Our whole backyard is wooded, so we mm -hmm. see squirrels all the time. We never see rabbits. Hardly ever, mm -hmm. but I planted four mums, and all of a sudden, all the leaf petals were gone, and then they started eating the center of the flower. They just, they were gone. I haven't seen squirrels here. I don't want you have deer. The, I'm sorry. Deer? No, we don't have deer. The answer is yes. <laughs> I have a in a pot. Oh, it's tall. I put out beautiful. Leaves. The squirrels go up, and I, I watched from my window uh -huh. while the, they would eat and the leaves would drop. Just take it off. The Almost skinned the entire bush of the leaves. And I know it's a squirrel, but I watched. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen the, the, the buds and camellias yeah. too, and I watch them. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and they will yeah. leave a Christmas uh, cactus out long mm -hmm. until it buds. <coughs> they will, buds they will start at the bud and just eat down as far as they think it's tender. <laughs> I learned something new. <laughs> I watched you eat which rabbits. Which you love them. Right yeah, most of my squirrels, when they're out there, they're usually digging up things I've just planted and whatnot. So I go out there and I, and I find the, my portulac or pansy or whatnot laying there drying out the next day, you know, after it's been transplanted, you know. Yeah, uh, a squirrel is a rat, isn't it? It's a tree rat, right? yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that looked like it was the end of the fern question. Oh, that's <laughs> Thanks for coming today.